Journey to the Center of the Word with your host, Michael Rood. Leave your inherited traditions behind and venture back in time with us as we explore the scriptures in the original context of the land, culture, and language of ancient Israel. This is the paradigm shift for which you've been waiting an entire lifetime. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Rood. The Ark of the Covenant, the search for the lost ark. 16 years ago, I was summoned to the home of one of the seven original founders of the Temple Treasures Institute in the middle of the night. He knew from a mutual friend who was a a journalist that I was somehow in the loop on something that the Temple Treasures Institute knew about but could only guess about the details. The chief rabbi of the state of Israel, Shlomo Gordon, publicly declared that the Ark of the Covenant was not lost, that it was deliberately hidden, that it was hidden in Mount Moriah, in the Temple Mount, and that he had been in the chamber and he had seen the Ark. The time frame was exactly at the very time after the Ark had been found and then for the next seven years, the, uh, the attempt to find the original route in to where the Ark of the Covenant was so that it could be retrieved. What I am going to tell you tonight and over the next several weeks is really a series of somewhat unbelievable divine appointments. And when I say unbelievable, because my background was I found myself in uh, Uh, in a church service six times a week for most of my life. I think it's seven if you count softball practice, church softball practice. But I, I, I was at every prayer meeting, every quarterly business meeting, which was really boring for kids, and every prayer meeting in which we prayed for people year after year, decade after decade, and never saw anybody healed. I saw no miracles. I saw nothing that I saw in the Bible, but this was what I was brought up in. And so those of you who are going to hear me say some of these things, you're gonna say, oh, that can't happen. I know, I was in your seat. I sat in your church pew for most of my life where nothing really happened. But I will tell you that the Almighty is alive, living and breathing, that Yeshua, when he said, I am going to go away, I'm going to send the comforter, he is going to be in you, he is going to teach you, and that it is the Messiah in us, the hope of glory, and as it was in the first century, that when he is in us, he then leads us by his spirit into the details of what we are to do to fulfill our destiny. See, to keep the Torah is really simple. It's the the commandments in the Torah are not grievous. They're not hard, okay? That's one thing we learn in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament writings is that keeping the Torah is not difficult. It's like the baseline here. Where life is exciting is not doing the minutia or trying to get anal retentive about the minutia. No, where it gets exciting is when we're walking with the power of God in our lives and fulfilling our destinies. And where it all began for me, we have to go back several years ago, and I, I, I think probably you have seen this. I want to imagine this, you to imagine this in your mind. And you've probably seen this particular comedy shtick where you've got a platoon formation. The commander is standing in front of everyone and says, I need a volunteer for a suicide mission. You're gonna get no apparent help from headquarters. You're gonna receive your orders along the way if you survive each portion of your mission. I need one person to step forward and volunteer. And in unison, the entire platoon takes one step back and there's one person standing left in front. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm the person that didn't get the memo to step back. What happened to me is not because I volunteered for any great mission in life, is that when I was eight years of age, I remember being at my bed on, 
on State Road, and I got down on my knees and I asked Jesus to come into my heart and that I would serve him my whole life. I remember that day very clearly. And I can't say that there was any profound change in my life that happened at that time. I mean, when you're eight years of age, it's not, you know, nothing really big happens. I mean, you know, I didn't see, you know, the, you know, a scroll come down from heaven or anything. You know, I just did what, you know, what was in my heart that I, I knew that I needed to do. And, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I remember in uh, Mrs. Franklin's second grade uh, class that she had a picture of George Washington praying and, and Jesus play, praying. And, and, and it just made such a, an impression in second grade as we would say the Pledge of Allegiance and she would teach us about praying. And it was eight years after that, I was in uh, Lincoln Avenue Baptist Church and we were praying for a Marine who was wounded in combat in Vietnam. All of his half-brothers, his sisters, uh, uh, you know, we'd go out to their farm. We were just, uh, you know, we were just family friends. They were uh, people that belonged to our church and, and their brother that I never met was, uh, was um, uh, nearly mortally wounded in combat. And then he, came back, he was alive and he came back. And I remember the morning that he came into Lincoln Avenue Baptist Church, he was in his, his dress greens and, uh, and uh, right after the service, he and several of the elders and the pastor escaped back into the pastor's study. A few weeks later, it seemed that it was the pastor who announced that he was, he was uh, quitting. He was going to uh, quit the pastorate. He joined the army and became a chaplain and he went to Vietnam. Uh, Jack Hopkins, my Sunday school teacher, his son was in Vietnam, he was a door gunner on a chopper, and so I worked, uh, I took kind of over Dennis's job, uh, you know, behind the hay baler and feeding the calves. I worked on the farm for Jack Hopkins uh, during that period of time while, while Dennis was in Vietnam. And then it came closer and I started, you know, we, we go to parties and, and some of the guys coming back from Nam, you know, you could see something very strange going on with them and, and, and you know, some, some, some guys were coming back in body bags. And, and so, you know, I know that, you know, I'm next, I'm next in line on this thing. And so I have my first brush with existentialism in which I'm, I'm really starting to question, you know, what is life all about? And I, remember the first time that I received a revelation from heaven. And I was looking out over the lawn of the Hall Fowler Memorial Library, and when I was questioning these things, and, 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 and I know that, you know, I, my life could be ended just like these other guys in a short amount of time, and I have no idea what life is about. And as I was thinking about these things and questioning about that, I saw the words in blazing fire in front of my eyes, thy word is truth. And I saw those letters burn, literally just burning in front of me. And that was a revelation. It wasn't anything I was looking for, but I knew then that if it's true, if this word, if this is truth, if this is what this conscious physical experience we call life, if this is what it's all about, if I can find the truth in here, this is gonna change everything. And so that's when I began seriously reading, hours and hours and hours a day, and I made the mistake of reading the book of Acts. When I read the book of Acts, all of a sudden, it's not just words, it's not just verses I'm memorizing in church, it's not out of a quarterly, I'm reading real things that take place and I am watching the movies play in my mind. And this is when it happens for me, that all of a sudden, words become movies and I see the movies play. And if I read one gospel account and doesn't agree with another one, all of a sudden the movie comes to a screeching halt. The film breaks, I've got to find the answer. If this is true, there can be no errors. If this is truth, there can be no contradictions. Now I know that this isn't the original. I know that we don't have the original. But I'm gonna have to learn Greek, I'm gonna have to learn Hebrew so that I can get back to the original in this. And so the adventure began, and that's when I decided I was gonna do the hardest thing I could think of doing. 
First of all, I took a look at my education system. I sat in the church pew after asking questions of the pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth group leaders, and I found out that once you ask the real questions and they don't have an answer and you don't let them out of lame answers, then they don't have any answers. And I kept on digging. And then I took a look around the people that are 70, 80 years old, and I thought all I have to do is is stay here and learn from these people, and I, at the age of 70, 80 years old, I'll have the same far fire in my soul, the same power of God in my life as I see in theirs. So I left and never went back again. I did the hardest thing I could think of doing. My draft number came up, I would never go in. I would never get drafted. So I thought, okay, I see people raised from the dead. I see miracles happen in the book of Acts. I'm going to do the hardest thing I can think of doing. Join the Marine Corps, enlist in the infantry, with a uh, a, uh, a guarantee to be in the infantry, so I would go to Vietnam. And and I said, and I have to be guaranteed that I'm going to Paris Island. I didn't want to be a Hollywood Marine. I wanted to go the hardest place. I saw the training films. I thought, oh, that looks brutal. Let me do that. So, So I got guaranteed, and I was the only one in Michigan. They put me on a separate plane, and I flew to Paris Island. Everyone else went out to uh, California and became a Hollywood Marine. Well, I was a natural. By then, I had I had fired hundreds of thousands of rounds, from pallet guns to BB guns to uh, you know high power rifles. You know, I was already an expert in trajectory and Kentucky windage. So, you know, while I was in the Marine Corps, I held the range record for the Eighth Marine Regiment for two years in a row. Uh, expert in uh, both rifle and in a 45 automatic. I, you know, I, I had a, a wonderful time out at, uh, uh, and you know, I still, I always refused to step back. I always volunteered. I never stepped back. I was thinking about this this morning, that uh, we were at the infantry training during boot camp, and uh, and so the drill instructor came up to me, and 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 uh, we were in training with, uh, with with several other companies, and he said, "Rude, I want you to go over there and steal one of the rifles." You know, they had stack arms. There's always some there Watch out! I want you to go over to this other platoon and steal a rifle. So I was a squad leader, so I called a fire team over, and I said, I'm gonna go over and pick a fight with this entire squad, and when I'm over there, I want you to stand in back of them, and when they got their back turned, you're standing there watching me, and then I want you to pick up the rifles, get four, two in each hand, and walk off with them. He told me to steal one. So I went over there and I picked a fight, and I mean, I, I, had, I had 25 guys irate. They wanted to kill me. And while everyone's attention was on me, my guys got all the rifles and walked out with them. And, and so, you know, so, you know, he was asking for one, but I was giving him, I was giving him the, the ranch. And of, of course, now my drill instructor has bragging rights over all the other drill instructors because our guys just stole all their rifles, their M16s. And so, no, no, they were M14s back in those days. I had to, had to remember back there. So, you know, I never stepped back. It was always, it was fun. And uh, uh, we sat in San Onofre after infantry training. And it turns out that uh, after two weeks, there were no more Marines going to Vietnam. That is when it officially ended as far as going over and replacing. Took a couple more years for the war to uh, finally uh, uh, go all the way down, and the, the embassy was then evacuated and taken. But I entered at, uh, at Marine Barracks in Cecil Field. I became the assistant pastor of a missionary Baptist church down there uh, for the Marine base down at Cecil Field. Uh, and, you know, I was always uh, bringing people out. That was, that was, that was my ministry, and uh, it was there that... Uh, um, I, I, I got in trouble. Uh, you know, out, uh, we were guarding a, a nuclear base. And uh, uh, so we, we watched over, over the base and there was a high security. You know, we were, we were guarding nukes and then we would have convoys that would load them up on trucks and then we would uh, take an, an armed uh, uh, escort over to load them on planes and then they'd be flown out uh, to, to meet boats uh, out there in the Atlantic. And, uh, and at night, we had this most amazing thing. We had a lot of water moccasins 
uh, that were out there, and so at night they would lay out on the, on the tarmac and start, try to stay warm and stretch themselves out, and if you'd go up, and we were carrying M14s at that point, and you'd go up and sneak up on them, and if you were accurate, you could come down with your rifle butt and hit them on the head and kill them with the metal rifle butt of your M14. Now, if you missed, then they could turn around and bite you. So, you know, this was a lot of excitement uh, in the middle of the night. That's how we entertained ourselves. But then I found this black snake. I found this black snake, and he was about five foot long, and I put him in my jacket and, uh, and got him all nice and warmed up. In the morning, the guard truck comes around, picks everyone up, and I get in the guard truck, and then this, this snake comes out and sticks his head out and starts licking at everyone else. Well, there are some people that, that are a little bit on the edgy side when they see snakes, and they started jumping out of the truck while it was going down the road. And uh, we pull up to the guard shack, and this one guy, he was really freaking out. He stayed in the truck, and, and then I, I got the snake out, and he took off running. I said, Private Carter, I'm gonna get you, and I wound that snake around, and he was out there like 30 yards. I let that snake go. It hit him in the back of the head and wrapped around his neck. <laughs> and he just screamed and ripped this off and kept on running. I understand he finally did come back, but the next day I was called in to the first sergeant's office. I figure I'm in big trouble, but turned out he was very amused and uh, gave me a promotion. <laughs> he said, uh, are you ready for a meritorious Lance Corporal? I already had meritorious a PFC coming out of boot camp, and uh, they needed someone to run a, a convoy, to be in charge of a convoy, and you had to be Lance Corporal to run a convoy. So, uh, so I did that, and then we got a call uh, a month later that uh, an embassy got hit, a lot of Marines were killed, and they were asking for more Marines for embassy duty. So I then packed my bags and went up to, um, uh, to Washington, D.C. Henderson Hall, right at the outskirts of Fort Myer, uh, which is uh, right attached to uh, the National Cemetery there. And it was there that, um, I, and I, I tell more of the story, I'm just gonna give you a very brief part of this story right now because in Michael Root Exposed, I get to tell a little bit more of the story because I have two and a half hours at that time. Ambassadors of A Root Awakening International have sponsored over 89 countries to take the gospel of the kingdom to the world. I sat down beside a man that one year ago, he had been in a cult, he had been in the church, and he was searching. And he was on the church channel and saw a rude awakening. And it changed his life, and he's here because we were able to support that and have that available. Now you can help us reach the world with your gift of $100 per month or more, or your one-time gift of $1,200 or more, we can reach more countries. I want people to wake up. That's, uh, that's why I, uh, I'm supporting a rude awakening. I just give with faith. I give in faith. Through this ministry, through Michael, we get to be part of ministering to people and changing lives. But if you're being fed somewhere, you need to support it. And if you're being fed by Michael Rood, you need to support it. With your gift of $100 or more a month, Michael Rood would like to bless you with this token of his appreciation. Let this surprise be a reminder to you of the many lives that are changed because of ambassadors of A Rood Awakening International, like you. Stand with us, be a part of this ministry, give, so that we can get the gospel of the kingdom out around the world. It's very important to get the word out there so that more people can come to the truth and, and realize just realize how much how much they're missing. We cannot outgive God. <laughs> You're really putting your, your money in the Ambassador Club to where it can really help maximum number of people. And so this message has to go out to the world. We need you to be involved. We need you to stand with us. Call today with your gift of $100 per month or your one-time gift of $1,200 or more and become a member of the Ambassadors Club. Help us bring it to the world. But I was right at the top of the class and it was very, very competitive. 
uh, being trained by the State Department to guard the, the ambassador, the United States Embassy, and, uh, and yet I was right at the top. Well, I was one and two, one and two, with this other guy right at the top, and then I was called in by the State Department, and I was told that they didn't believe that my beliefs, they said my beliefs would, are, are not in accordance with the Marine unit or the goals and mission of the State Department. Why? Because I was reading the Bible. I was taking my, my people out, we would shine our boots and brass out in Arlington National Cemetery, and this, this is where I was teaching them the scriptures, motivating them, we had the top detachment and the whole thing, and then, and when that happened, uh, the, the, uh, the staff sergeant, he hit the roof, the gunnery sergeant said, we're gonna take this all the way to the top. I said, no, this is the will of God. And I didn't know how things were gonna turn out, but I, I ended up getting shipped down. They, they wanted me to be a conscious objector and to throw me out. Well, I joined to go to war. I figured I was trained all my life to go to war. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not a conscientious objector. And so they put me uh, down the 8th Marine Regiment. I got down there. Uh, they, they told me to pack all my stuff in a foot locker, and they, and they put me on a ship. We were down there in the Caribbean, and within a week, the Navy lost all of my uniforms, except for one, what I was wearing. And I'm out to sea in one skanky uniform. I come from the spit and polish of the Marine Corps to, to this situation, but what happens, we end up in the jungle of Panama, and that's when things start breaking loose. I get put in the company office, they look at my GCT, they say, I'm smarter than the, uh, the, the, the colonel, and so they, they put me on the job of, well, I'm not smarter, I just, you know, it, they, they do these tests. I guess I remembered something, someplace. So they put me on the unit diary, which is to memorize this computer code that you use a special computer typewriter uh, before you know, computers were popular. Wait, what was this? Back in 1972, 73. And this is how the unit diary is taken care of. So I had to learn this computer language, and so they put us in this place, in this bombed out building with a generator in the middle of the jungle in Panama. And uh, during the lunch, I sat down and I'm reading my Bible. I just get put in this unit and everyone's snickering around me. The second day, finally, they're still snickering. This guy reading the Bible. You know, it must be some kind of pansy reading the Bible. And so the sergeant sits down and says, Rude, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading about the end of the world. <laughs> he said, what? And then that afternoon, nobody went to work. Everyone sat around as I taught them out of Zechariah. And uh, then we ended up down in uh, Caracas, Venezuela. And this is where they grabbed my book, The Late Great Planet Earth. And they went out, they were gonna uh, go out and go drinking that night, but they took my book with them, A Late Great Planet Earth, and they went and checked into a hotel, and one of them started reading it aloud. All these Marines and Navy guys with them, and, uh, and uh, uh, Dan Rangel and I found ourselves staying overnight with the priest at a, at a convent uh, there in town. And uh, we didn't even know what happened, but that night as he began reading, nobody went out that night. They read the book aloud all night long and then all got down on their knees at the crack of dawn and asked Jesus to come into their heart. That's all they knew to do. The next day, we stopped down, downtown Caracas, Venezuela. We go into a Bible bookstore, and I said, you know, I need to get so, some Bibles here because, you know, I always find people that are interested in the Bible. So we go in, and we're talking to the woman. Now we don't have any Bibles. You know, Daniel is, uh, is interpreting. And then a guy from the back room comes out and speaks in English. You want English Bibles? And I said, yeah. And he comes out with a whole case of English Bibles. And he says, here, they're yours. I said, no, I only need uh, just a few of them. He says, no, take them, you're gonna need them. And so, you know, someone left them here a couple years ago, they're for you. So we go back to the ship, we get to the top of the gangplank, request permission to come aboard, and right then, three Marines come running across the deck from the company office, rude, rude, you never believe what happened. I put the box of books down there, and they told me right then what happened the night before, and I get up there, and all the Bibles are gone in 10 minutes. I mean, a whole case of them just like that, 
and within two weeks when we get to, uh, uh, um, get to Vegas, Puerto Rico, we have the largest peacetime baptism that is ever done in the Navy. Now before you go into combat, everybody gets baptized just in case this whole God thing is really true and you're probably gonna die anyway. But in peacetime, that changed everything. And so I get back to the United States and you know, remember, I've only got one uniform, I'm still wearing it. I take it off, wash it in the sink, put it back on. I, 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 I do not look like the squared away Marine. I get back and my foot locker, what I left behind was broken into, everything was stolen. I have lost everything and then I have this terrible fever. And I am in the squad bay up on the third level and I have a fever that lasts for two days and then I am really questioning what I am doing here. I've gone from the pinnacle of what duty in the Marine Corps is, I've gone down into the absolute squalor. Guys coming back from Vietnam, it's a mess. Eighth Marine Regiment was a cesspool at that point in time and I was so defeated at that moment in time. And then, with when I had that fever, I had a vision. And what that vision was is that I was on a seed that was absolutely just a, a, just a thunderous stormy sea, and I was on a boat that was just completely shredded and torn to pieces and I was reaching down the water and pulling these people onto the boat. And at the end, I had rescued all these people in this absolutely ratted, destroyed, tattered boat. And I knew that I was to stay the course, that I was doing what I was supposed to do, and that my course in life was going to be that I was going to rescue the lost and it was not going to be pretty. It was not gonna be glorious. It was gonna be just barely able to make it through with a ship that's on its way down. The fever broke. I went out right after that, 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 that vision. The fever broke. I went out onto the back deck and there it was a, a brochure, a pamphlet from the children of God. Never heard of the children of God. I didn't listen to Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young, about came upon a child of God, you know, as he's on the way to Woodstock. I never heard about the children of God. But I read this, this little pamphlet or whatever, and I sat there and, and it was just resonated with me and I prayed, I need to find these people. And so I was praying there out loud, I need to find these people because there was something in there that just really grabbed my attention. And then, which nobody does, nobody runs up the back stairs, this guy comes up the back stairs and, 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 and says to me, just looks at me and said, there's a children of God meeting outside of town a few miles, would you like to go with me? I didn't even know this person. I said, yes. So I went out there, and that is where uh, I ended up spending a little bit of time out there. I was still in the Marine Corps. I didn't you know, drop out of the world and become a, a hippie child of God or anything. But I had my Thompson chain reference, and I remember Emmanuel, uh, one morning uh, when I was out there, he opened to Daniel chapter nine. And in Daniel chapter nine, he took his greasy finger, he was working in the kitchen, and this is not allowed. You do not touch my Bible with a greasy finger. But he took his greasy finger and was pointing out in Daniel chapter nine, and when he did that, it stained my Bible. And I was like, you know, I just wanted to smack him. But it permanently stained my Bible there, and it permanently stained my life. Because right there, as I read that, 70 weeks, 77s are determined upon thy people and upon the holy city to finish their transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. 
Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah of the Prince will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street will be built again and the wall even in troublous times and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and under the end of the war um, uh, and the end shall be with the flood and under the end of the war desolations shall be determined and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even unto the uh, time of the end and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That would not leave me alone. And, you know, and after that, you know, I, I studied Sir Isaac Newton's work on this. I, I studied uh, Sir Robert Anderson's work on this. And I, I found that every one of them would give their opinions on this, but they could never back it up. The math never worked all the way through. Robert Anderson said, well, there are 360 days in a biblical year, 365 days in a solar year, so you have to subtract and you add and then you multiply and all that. And he comes up with this thing, but he never proves when anything starts. You know, it just they are jumping to conclusions that I knew. The math never worked on this. But this is where it started in the book of Daniel at that time. Now, Almost immediately, I got sent down to Cuba for the next six months. And the next six months, I saw miracles happen when I was down there. And then I came back to the next phase that's going to then end up leading me to the Ark of the Covenant and the details concerning the Ark of the Covenant. Because this confirmation of the covenant that's spoken here Hal Lindsey came up with the idea that this confirmation of the covenant is the Antichrist making a land deal with Israel. Nothing in the context is anything about that. Nowhere in the book of Daniel is there anything about that. He extrapolated it from reading all prophecy and read it back into this. Because to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and authenticate the prophet and to anoint the most holy, none of those things have anything to do with the Antichrist. But yet, everyone in America filters everything we know about Bible prophecy through what Hal Lindsey published back in the late 60s. And people, as I begin to lay this thing out, they will say, well, wh how can you say that he who confirms the covenant is the Messiah? Well, because it's right there in the text. It's because they have already got their mind changed thinking that it's the Antichrist who makes a land deal, and they're the one that has to prove that. I don't have to prove what's plainly in the, te the text on this. And so, after the Ark of the Covenant, and after this meeting with the founders of the uh, Temple Treasures Institute, and finding out the detail of what it was that Slomo Goran saw and where he found it, that is where you are now going to get the rest of the story. Because the confirmation of the covenant is what begins the last Shavua, and that has not transpired yet. That is still on the horizon, but the way things are going right now, this could shake up within the next couple years. Everything looks like it is lining up. You are so precious to the Almighty that he gave up his firstborn son for you. By his sacrifice, you were redeemed. Right now, when you make a donation of $25 or more to A Rood Awakening International, Michael Rood will send you The Redemption of the Firstborn, a brand new DVD teaching you can't get anywhere else. This is a, an, uh, an opportunity for a father and a mother to recognize that their firstborn son does not belong to them. 
And that firstborn son belongs to the Almighty. It's not for sale, and it's not on YouTube. It's a special teaching reserved just for you when you donate $25 or more to A Root Awakening in July. Call today or visit our website to receive The Redemption of the Firstborn, a brand new exclusive teaching from Michael Rood. A short time that I spent with the children of God, I saw miraculous things happen for the first time in my life. I saw miracles happen. I, at that time, was filled with the Spirit and manifested the Spirit. I, and this was the first real reality that I saw healing and miracles take place. And then, boom, I'm down to uh, Cuba. One night, coming back on the guard truck, I get hit in the eye with a beetle it, uh, I'm in such pain, they immediately get me over to the, uh, to the dispensary uh, where the corpsmen there uh, are able to pry my eye open, look at it, and my cornea has a gash in it. I mean, it is a cut cornea, it's not scratched. And so they put some, uh, some ointment in it, antibiotic, they patch it up, say, you gotta come back, you know, we can't do anything, the doctor will have to see you first thing in the morning. I looked at the corpsman and I said, God is gonna heal me. You're gonna see God is gonna heal me. Now I've never said that in my life before. I don't know if I said it uh, after that, but I, that's what I said, God is gonna heal me. The next morning I get back, he's still on duty. The doctor takes the patch off my eye. I look, I'm fine, he looks in my eye and, and the corpsman is standing there and, he's, and he said his cornea was cut last night. And he said, well, there's nothing wrong with it now. And so he thinks he's exaggerating. And, but both corpsmen were there. Said, no, no, we patched him up last night. His cornea was cut. It was gashed open. And we said to come back. And the, and the doctor just walked out. And the corpsman said, you said God was gonna heal you. I said, God healed me. I never saw the corpsman again, except a year later. Eighth Marine Regiment, Camp Geiger. I'm on my way to the chow hall, and here comes this Brig Corman walking the other, walking this way, and I stopped him, and I said, I'm having a fellowship at my place tonight, you wanna come? And he said, absolutely. I saw God heal you in Cuba a year ago. I, I am seeing incredible miracles take place. I get back, but when I get back from Cuba, I'm on my way, I'm walking down the road where the old Children of God commune was, and as I'm walking down the road, I'm a mile away, and I hear a voice that says they're gone, but it's for the best. I got down there, it was all overgrown, they in fact were gone. I went back, now I'm praying, I don't know what to do. What is next? I'm on, uh, I'm on guard duty, I'm sitting out under a tree in the morning, reading my Bible, a Marine comes by and says, uh, um, what are you doing? I said, I'm reading the Bible. And he says, there's uh, the uh, chaplain over here is uh, having a, a study at noontime. Uh, come over and join us. And I said, I never met a chaplain who knows anything about the Bible yet. And uh, he said, no, this guy is different. This guy is on fire. I said, okay. So I went over, a group of a dozen of Marines were sitting around, and he just locked his eyes on me and taught the whole time, raced straight to me for like 40 minutes, and I was completely blown away. I said, where did you get this? Where did you get this understanding and this fire? And he said, well, I read these books uh, from the Way International. And he said, they're starting a fellowship here, and told me where it was, and I went out to it. And that's when I got involved with the cult called the Way International. And it was an answer to prayer. Why? Because when I read the book of Revelation, when I saw the one thing Yeshua hates with a vengeance is the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And I prayed that he would teach me what the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans are. I earnestly prayed for that. And to understand it, I ended up in the most restrictive, the most controlling Nicolaitan cult on the planet. But when I went there, when, uh, when I went there and started doing, taking their classes, I'm learning the same things I learned in this Baptist book, The Golden Keys to uh, a Biblical Understanding. 
you know, how to interpret the Bible. And I'm learning good things out of here, and there are things that I didn't agree with, but you know, as I got my other Marine friends involved in it, and they took this long 33-hour class, you know, I had been with some of these guys for a couple years, and I'm trying to get them to witness and stand on their own. They take that class, and it's like they can stand on their own. They know the Bible enough, and they're out there witnessing to people. And it's like, wow, this is like a miracle that, you know, you can learn enough about the Bible in like three weeks period of time to where, you know, you, you, you can take a stand on stuff. And yet, there's always things that I didn't agree with. But, you know, I was raised with a lot of this stuff. They were the masters of teaching dispensationalism, replacement theology, pre-tribulation rapture. These are all the things that I was raised with. I was an ultra-dispensational, pre-tribulation secret rapturist. So these just fit right in line. But, you know, then I started really digging in and I finding out that some things really don't work on this thing. First of all, you know, when we're starting to deal with end times, we're dealing with the rapture, we're dealing with the timing of when the Messiah comes in the last Shavuot and some of these different prophetic scriptures, the Ark of the Covenant and the revealing of the covenant and what that has to do with the confirmation of the covenant in the book of Daniel chapter nine and the anointing of the most holy and making reconciliation for iniquity, all of these things are all intertwined, ladies and gentlemen, and I was getting embedded in my brain with all of this systematic theology that replaces Israel. Israel's been done away with, why? Because Jesus came and they didn't recognize their Messiah, they killed him, and so God is finished with Israel. And now he's turning it all over to Gentile Roman Catholics or whatever, okay? You know, it's basically the the concept there, okay? Uh, First of all, it's complete nonsense to begin with. Yeshua didn't come the the first time to be heralded as the Messiah. Anytime someone said that, I know who you are, you're the son of David, you're the Messiah, he'd say, shut up! He wouldn't let his disciples say that he was the Messiah. But what do you see over and over and over and over, and if you don't see it, get your chronological gospels. He is proclaiming himself as the prophet. The people are saying he is the prophet, the prophet we must hear and obey. The one who comes to set the record straight, to divide the Torah from the rules and regulations that have been added and taken away by men to where they make their own religious system in order to manipulate, intimidate, and control people and so they can milk the sheeple. Yeshua sets us free from religion. That's why he came the first time. The king is not present right now, that's why everyone's doing whatever they want to do. And they think they can get away with it. But this is what we learned in the Revelation seminar that we did. Yeshua is walking among the lampstands. You're not pulling wool over on his eyes, he sees everything that's going on. You're not kidding him. And there's gonna come a time that the hand of judgment is coming down, he will separate the true sheep from the false prophets, and the brimstone is gonna hit the fan, ladies and gentlemen. We are living on the cusp of this right now. The whole economic system of the world is held together by smoke and mirrors because they want to hold it together right now. But when they decide to drop the hammer, it's all over but the crying. That's why I say we have a small window of opportunity. Just like in Egypt, just like in China, at any moment they can shut down the internet and it's all over. It is bare survival, ladies and gentlemen. But right now, we better not squander the only opportunity that mankind has had to get the true gospel of the kingdom out to the world. If we do not do our responsibility now, don't complain to the Almighty because he doesn't preserve you in the time of trouble ahead. I'm just saying it straight. This is the word that I get. This is the word that I got. I'm giving it to you because this is reality. You know, you're not gonna go through the tribulation with a freezer that never runs out and you can watch Oprah reruns on your VCR until the return. It ain't gonna happen. Things are gonna get tough. 
there is no pre-tribulation rapture. Thus saith Yehovah. And I don't say anything like that without direct revelation. This is my mission. This is my ministry. I taught the pre-tribulation rapture. I was for 20 years a paid professional false prophet. I spoke presumptuously. I presumed that my denomination in my theological cemetery were correct. I presumed wrong, they were dead wrong, and now it, the record needs to be set straight, and that is what I'm doing. So if I've upset you out there in cyberspace, good. Today, there are only three resurrections in the scripture. We read about them in 1 Corinthians 15. This is a, a detail here. And what is going on in this, uh, in this is that there are people that are preaching that there is no resurrection. Shaul says, if there's no resurrection, we're like the most miserable people on earth because we're getting persecuted now. If there's no resurrection, why don't we just eat, drink, and be merry? But there is a resurrection. All men will be made alive. But now it says, now is Messiah has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that slept. And then it says, for every man will be made alive in his own order. Just as every man dies, everyone's gonna be made alive in their own order. Verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 15. Messiah, the first fruits, those who are Messiahs at his coming. Then cometh the end. The word cometh is in italics. It's not in the text. Then the end. Then the end. When he, the Messiah, shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he, Yeshua, will have put down all rule and all authority and all power, for he, he, the Messiah, for he, the Messiah, must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he that put all things under, God who put all things under his, Yeshua's feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he, God, is accepted, which did put all things under him, Yeshua. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, Yeshua, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him, God, that put all things under Yeshua, that God may be all in all. Every man will be made alive in his own order. So we have the detail of the Gospels. We have the resurrection of Yeshua and the first fruits who were raised when he arose, they arose and appeared to many in the streets of Jerusalem, and then the next morning, at the time of the first fruit offering, Yom Bikarim, Yeshua, who then sees Miriam first, told her, go tell my disciples, first of all, don't touch me. I have not yet ascended to my Father in heaven, he said, because the high priest must be in seclusion from the Passover offering until he offers the first fruit offering in the temple. Yeshua said, don't touch me. Now, go tell my disciples that I ascend to my Father and their Father, my God and their God, and then meet me in the Galilee. Miriam leaves, Yeshua ascends with the first fruits, presents them before the Father's throne in heaven, and is back down on the earth, intercepting the other women who later come with the spices. And when they come, they see the angel, they head on back to tell the disciples, Yeshua meets them on the way, and in the Hebrew Matthew it says, Yehovah saves you. They held him by the feet. Why could they hold him by the feet now? Miriam couldn't an hour earlier because now he's presented the first fruits in the throne in heaven and is back on the earth. Thomas can be invited to put his hand in the nail prints after that. So here we have Messiah and their first fruits. Then what's next? The Messiah's at his coming. The Messiah's at his coming and then we have the end the last resurrection, which we read about in the end of the book of the Revelation, when everyone who's ever lived is resurrected and stands before the great white throne in judgment. And the books are open. Whose ever name is not found written in the book of life is then cast into the lake of fire. And so here we have it. We have the, the first one, the gospel's detail number one, Messiah and the first fruits, that resurrection. Number two, 
Matthew 24 details exactly what the disciples are asking. What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? He says, listen up so that you're not deceived. He said, false teachers and false prophets will tell you I'm coming tamion, in secret. Don't believe them. He says, after the, the tribulation of those days that begins with the abomination of desolation, then you will see the sky rip open like lightning from the east to the west when I send my angels down and gather together the elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. When does that, when does that resurrection and that gathering together of his disciples, because the disciples are asking, what does that happen? after the tribulation of those days. That's when it happens. Revelation, what does it say? At the last trump, it's the seventh trump. Now has come the time of the dead when the righteous are raised and rewarded. His servants and prophets, small and great, are raised and rewarded, and he will now pour out his wrath and will destroy those destroyers of the earth. And then, right after the seventh trumpet, what is it? The bowls of wrath. Clear as can be. When? At the last trumpet. Then we have 1 Corinthians. Again, when the dead are raised and the righteous rewarded. Oh, where is that? It's right in here someplace. Be sure, oh, oh, wow, here it is. Now this I say, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. You must be born again into a body that can live in the eternal kingdom. Flesh and blood doesn't go. Mortal doesn't go. Corrupted doesn't go. Behold, I show you a mystery, something that has not yet been before revealed or that which cannot be revealed to the novices or the uninitiated. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. We're not all gonna be dead and in the grave. Sleep is a euphemism because it is a state that will end. It will end at the resurrection. That's why the euphemism sleep is used, okay? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that's how fast it's gonna happen. At the last trump is when it happens. Where is he getting this mystery from, ladies and gentlemen? From Yeshua. Yeshua knows when he's gonna come back. He knows the resurrection is at the last trump. Maybe he doesn't know the day and hour, maybe that's still a secret, okay? Okay, I'll give you that. But the book of Revelation, what is the revelation of St. John the Divine? No, it's a revelation of Yeshua Messiah for John to give to the servants of the Messiah so they would understand and know the things which surely must come to pass. When is a gathering together? When? At the last trumpet. Yeshua is giving the same revelation to Yohanan as he does to Shaul. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised with an incorruptible body, and we, who are alive and remain, the mortal, will put on immortality. Those are the resurrections, and then we've got one more coming down the line after that, and that's the end resurrection. Now, how do we get a pre-tribulation rapture? First of all, we have to redefine Matthew 24. First of all, dispensational theology will say, here's dispensational theology because you can't have a pre-tribulation rapture without dispensational theology. Jesus is talking to his disciples who are Jews. Because the Jews reject Jesus, then he rejects the Jews and it's all turned over to the Gentiles. And so anything that Jesus says has nothing to do with us in this day and time. We only listen to what Paul says. We ignore what Yeshua says. We don't follow him. Even though Yeshua said, follow me, even though Paul said, follow me as I follow the Messiah, we can't do that because Jesus said, don't follow those who preach a secret rapture before the end. So we have to ignore everything he says. Oh, there's another one. Dispensational theology. Yeshua really didn't understand the grace administration. He didn't really understand that, you know, 
that after he leaves, it's, everything's different because the Jews rejected him. And so we don't listen to anything that he has to say. So, Matthew 24, we have to change it for Yeshua coming for the saints, and we have to change it to him coming with his saints to take over the planet Earth. We have to change it, okay? Because he really doesn't know what he's talking about, okay? And then uh, those false prophets that he says are gonna come and teach that he's coming in secret, even though, you know, why is it secret? Because it's not in the scriptures. It's Gnosticism, it's a secret revelation that only the enlightened really understand. And unless you really understand the different ages in which God works and how he works, unless you really understand this thing, you really can't understand the secret rapture. And then, we have to change in Thessalonians, the day of Christ, we have to change that, because it's only used once in the Bible, the day of Christ can't mean when Yeshua comes and relieves the pain and strain of tribulation, when he comes with the angels, the messengers of his might, and relieves the pain and strain of tribulation, we've gotta change that, the day of Christ, into him coming at the Battle of Armageddon. That can't happen until there's a rapture. Ladies and gentlemen, in our next session, we're going to get into the detail on that very thing, because Shaul is going to lay it out. And it's, it's absolutely imperative that you and the rest of the world understands that there is no pre-tribulation rapture. Yeshua said, I'm telling you beforehand that there is going to be false prophets. There are gonna be false prophets that are going to mislead you. I am foretelling this, and when they do that, do not follow them. They are deceivers. They say they represent me, but they don't. Our next session, we'll get into the depth of that and then its relationship to the revealing of the Ark of the Covenant. I'd like to pray. Shavuotov, people, have a good week.